The Trumpet Daily from Jerusalem. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Trumpet Daily. This summer, 15 of our students from Armstrong College have been working here in Jerusalem on the excavation at the Ophel. Behind me in the distance, you can see the white tents that cover the dig site just below the, the two mosques there on the, the Temple Mount. Now, this particular phase of digging will wrap up over the next couple weeks, and Dr. Alat Mazar hopes to begin the fourth and final phase of the Ophel dig sometime in early 2014. To keep right up to date with all the progress on the Ophel dig, Make sure you visit the keytodavidcity.com. That's keytodavidcity.com. On that website, you have uh, all kinds of updates on certain finds from the dig and interviews with Dr. Mazar and, and other uh, scholars in the field. So uh, that's keytodavidcity.com. Let's begin today's study in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 89 and read some about the covenant that God made with King David anciently. Now, for the past 20 or, or 30 years, Dr. Mazar has probably done more than any other archaeologist to shape the way the world thinks about ancient Jerusalem and the man who established this city, King David, of course. And she's done that by letting the Bible serve as her guidebook for digging. Here in Psalm 89, verse 3, it says, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Your seed, he says, will I establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. God said he would build up or raise up David's throne to all generations. God promised that David's throne would continue forever. But most people, of course, don't really believe that. They don't believe that God was able to preserve the throne during those last days of Judah. Skip down to verse 30. It says, If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Now, some have reasoned that this means the covenant was conditional. But you'd have to twist the scriptures in order to say that. God says here, if the children of Israel disobeyed, that they would be punished. He did say that. We just read it. But the Davidic covenant would not be broken. The promise that God made to David about that throne continuing for all generations, that would not be broken. Notice what it says, verse 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. Now, you can try to spiritualize this away if you like. Some do that, saying that, well, maybe Jesus Christ took over the throne uh, 2,000 years ago. But while Christ certainly did come from, from David's line, he didn't take over a throne at his first coming. That's, that's obvious. He was crucified. He was resurrected to life and ascended to heaven where he sits on God's throne, it says. And then the Bible goes on elsewhere and says that he will soon return to this earth. And then he's going to take over David's throne. He'll rule from David's throne. Read that for yourself in Luke chapter 1. Now, just ask yourself this question. How could Jesus Christ return to take over a non-existent throne? If, if David's throne disappeared 2,600 years ago when, when Judah was taken captive, where is that throne that Jesus is going to return to? Will it then suddenly reappear at Christ's coming? Or did God, as he promised he would, preserve that throne? God did say, after all, I will not lie to David. My covenant will I not break. That's what God assured us. Verse 38, staying here in the psalm. But you have cast off and abhorred. You have been wroth with your anointed. You have made void the covenant of your servant. You have profaned his crown by casting it 
to the ground. Now these are some interesting verses here. The, the prophet Jeremiah is the one who most likely wrote this psalm. And he's speaking here of Judah's demise. I think all the commentaries would agree on that. But notice here that, that the author is, is beside himself over what had happened to David's throne. Let's look at uh, the book of Jeremiah. As I said, Jeremiah is the, the one who most likely uh, wrote that particular psalm. And as those two verses we just read brought out, I mean, whoever was writing it was wondering how God was going to keep the promise that he had made to David. Now, God was testing Jeremiah's faith. You can see that all through the book of Jeremiah. He was testing the faith of his prophet to see if he would hold true to the commission that he had given Jeremiah from the very beginning. You can see that in Jeremiah 1, how that God said he was going to use his prophet to uproot and to tear down and then to go and build up elsewhere. And you can uh, study the United States and Britain in prophecy to understand more about uh, that particular mission that God gave to Jeremiah. Now here in Jeremiah 39, uh, we pick it up in the story here where na the, the nation of Judah was, was about to be smashed by the Babylonians. And Zedekiah, uh, Judah's last king, had locked Jeremiah in prison, thinking that that would be the end of Judah's troubles. They wanted to blame it all on the prophet who had all of this bad news the way they saw it. And so they thought, well, let's just get rid of the messenger and that'll take care of our problems. But it didn't. In the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah, besieged Jerusalem, this city behind me, captured Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and put out his eyes. And then he killed all of his sons, as well as all the nobles in the, the Judean court. So, I mean, it was a, a, an utter <laughs> uh, destruction of that royal family, one would think, one would assume. Uh, Jeremiah 39 here, verse 8, says, And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him, uh, Jeremiah that is, and look well to him, and do him no harm, but do unto him even as he shall say unto you." So in the midst of Judah's demise, Jeremiah the prophet was given tremendous favor from the king of Babylon. They let him out of the dungeon and he was protected during this tribulation. And so were a few others as we'll see in just a moment. God did spare just a handful of people that he needed to fulfill his will. Jeremiah chapter 40 now, look at verse 2. It says, And the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said unto him, The Lord your God has pronounced this evil upon this place. So here God, I mean, Jeremiah was in a dungeon and it was difficult to maintain a positive outlook and focus. And then, of course, when he hears that the, the king, King Zedekiah, is, uh, you know, has his eyes put out and he's carted off to Babylon, all of his sons are killed, uh, this was discouraging to him. And uh, he was, as you uh, read in that psalm, he was wondering, well, how could this happen to the throne? God's throne, how could this happen to the crown of David? And yet here in Jeremiah 40, we see God using, pretty much, he's, he's using a Babylonian captain, of all people, to remind Jeremiah that the God of Israel had brought all this evil upon Judah. The God of Israel, not, not Babylon, he said, the Lord your God has pronounced this evil upon this place. God's the one that allowed it to happen. And in fact, God promised that it would if, if Judah didn't repent. God said it would happen. And so we, we shouldn't be surprised by it. But is God able to still preserve and maintain his covenant with David and that throne? Even as Judah has to go off into captivity because of its many sins? continue the story here in verse 3. It says, Now the Lord has brought it and done according as he has said, because you have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed his voice. Therefore this thing is come upon you. Now God must have inspired this man, this Babylonian captain, because Jeremiah probably needed it. He probably needed to be reminded of the fact that this was all God's doing. And that just as God had prophesied through Jeremiah. Notice verse 4. 
It says, And now, behold, I loose thee uh, this day from the chains which were upon your hand. If it seem good unto you to come with me into Babylon, come, and I will look well unto you. But if it seem ill unto you to come with me into Babylon, forbear. Behold, all the land is before you. This is the Babylonian captain talking to God's prophet. He says, Whether it seems good and convenient for you to go, then go. Go there. Now, he was, he was essentially offering God's prophet a prominent position in the Babylonian court, which in looking around Judah, which was in flames, I mean, this would have been a tempting offer for, for a man to leave and go somewhere else and be a prominent figure in the Babylonian government. He would have been taken care of, I think. Notice verse 5. It says, Now while he was not yet gone back, or the meaning there is he, he hesitated slightly, he said, uh, Go back also to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has made governor over the cities of Judah, and dwell with uh, him among the people, or go wheresoever it seems convenient unto you to go. So the captain of the guard gave him victuals and a reward and let him go. Now the, the meaning there is, is clarified a little bit in, in some of the commentaries. JFB, uh, for instance, says when Jeremiah hesitated whether uh, it would be best for him to go, Nebuzaradan proceeded to say, go then to Gedaliah. So uh, Jeremiah evidently hesitated slightly and, and then God again used this commander to sort of nudge him in the direction of Gedaliah, the, one of the leaders over the, the few remaining Jews in Mizpah. Verse 6, it says, Then went Jeremiah unto Gedaliah the son of Ahikam to Mizpah, and dwelt with him among the people that were left in the land. So, so Nebuchadnezzar had appointed Gedaliah to be the governor over that small remnant of, uh, of lowly Jews, the few that were left. Uh, but if you continue reading in the story, we can't uh, read through all the verses. Uh, later on in the, uh, the account, Gedaliah was assassinated by another Jew named Ishmael. You can read uh, at the start of, of Jeremiah 41, uh, verses 1 through 2. And Ishmael basically took that small band of Jews captive. And that was the group that Jeremiah was in the midst of. And so here he is captured yet again. Here he is enslaved yet again, this time at the hand of his own people. Look at Jeremiah 41 here in verse 10. It says, Then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were uh, in Mizpah, even the king's daughters, and all the people that remained in Mizpah. Even the king's daughters. Here, here's where we're finally introduced to the survivors of the royal family. The king's own daughters, Zedekiah's daughters. So right in the midst of all this chaos and confusion and tribulation, Jeremiah met a young princess by the name of Tiatefi. Now after this, uh, picking it up later in the story, another Jew by the name of Johanan, he rescued that band of Jews, including Jeremiah and Baruch and the king's daughters. You can see that in verses 11 and 12. Now, it was also during this, this power struggle that the Jews concluded that uh, it would be better to flee down to Egypt and to avoid uh, associating with you know, the Babylonians at all. They didn't want to be conquered again by Babylon, so they wanted to leave for Egypt. Notice Jeremiah 42 now and verse 1. It says, Then all the captains of the forces, and Johanan the son of uh, Korea, and uh, Jezaniah the son of uh, Hosea, and all the people, from the least even unto the greatest, came near and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech you, our supplication be accepted before you, and pray for us unto the Lord your God, even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as your eyes do behold us. So these Jews had, had uh, really, they already decided that they were going to Egypt. You can see that if you read all the details in the chapter. But they wanted God to bless their decision. So they come to Jeremiah and they say, look, go and pray to God and, and uh, hopefully you'll come back with the, uh, the answer that we want. They weren't really interested in receiving direction from God or from his prophet. They wanted to go their own way. They were determined to do that. Now, by this point, I think you could say that Jeremiah was past his, his point of discouragement there being in the dungeon and wondering what was going to happen to David's throne and so on. By this point, he's locked in, spiritually speaking. He was no longer discouraged. God had revealed 
how the throne would be preserved. After all that he had been through, God had revealed how the covenant he made with David would stand fast. Notice in verse 10, it says, If uh, you will still abide in this land, then will I build you and not pull you down, and I will plant you and not pluck you up, for I repent me of the evil that I had done unto you. Now, God had worked out all of these unbelievable events so that Jeremiah could reestablish the throne of King David and, and preserve David's kingly line right up to the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. God also allowed these many twists and turns along the way, all the sore trials and the tests that Jeremiah was subjected to in order to strengthen his faith. Look at Jeremiah 45, what we just read there. It talked about planting and, and establishing. God told that, that small band of Jews that you know, he could do it right there through them if they uh, wouldn't go down to Egypt as they wanted. Now over here in Jeremiah 45, it's a short little chapter about uh, Jeremiah's assistant, uh, Baruch. In verse 2, it says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, unto you, O Baruch, you did say, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing and find no rest. So this little chapter is about how the strain of, of working for God was beginning to wear down Baruch, who was, as I say, Jeremiah's assistant. Baruch started thinking not about the things of God and the work of God, but he started thinking selfishly about what he wanted. Look at verse 4. It says, Thus shall you say unto him, this is the message God had for Baruch, The Lord says thus, Behold, that which I have built will I break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up, even this whole land. Look at what's coming upon Judah, Baruch. This is not the time to be thinking about yourself. Yeah, you look at what God warned him there with. It was exactly what, going back to the beginning of Jeremiah, chapter 1, it was exactly what he had told Jeremiah from the beginning. And Baruch knew all about this. This was their mission. They were to warn Judah. And they were to warn Judah that God was going to tear down and pluck up from the roots. But as Jeremiah 1.10 also brings out, I mean, that was not where it would finish with Judah's demise and the crown being stamped into the ground, and then that's it. The history ends. The throne ends. The line of David concludes. God in this passage to Baruch is, is giving him a reminder of the commission that he had given Jeremiah from the very beginning. God made a promise. And no matter how bad things might look all around, he wants his servants to look to him, to trust him, to follow him, to believe him. Verse 5, it says, And seek you great things for yourself, Baruch? Seek them not, for behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, says the Lord. But your life will I give unto you for a prey in all places where you go. Now, the, the wording is a little bit awkward there in the King James. The, uh, the JFB commentary says, Be content with this boon of life, which I will rescue from imminent death even as when all things are given up to plunder. God said to him, Be content with the fact that I'll spare your life in the midst of this ruin. I'll protect you. Now, why did God spare Baruch's life? What did he want Jeremiah and Baruch to do? Where'd they go? Well, it all gets back to that unbreakable covenant that God made with King David. It's about what God originally established in this city of Jerusalem. Let me just read uh, verse 5 again, this time from the Moffat translation. Moffat says, Do you expect smooth fortunes for yourself? Never expect that. Only I promise you, as I bring doom now upon all mankind, I will let you escape with your own life wherever you must go. What a promise from God here. Wherever you must go. Baruch had some place to go. And so did Jeremiah. And so did the king's daughters. Do you know where they went? Well, the, the true history of where they went, that story is packed with, with more suspense than any work of fiction. And you can learn all about it. You can learn all that you need to know if you're willing to just do a little bit of digging. You just need to let the Bible serve as your guide like Dr. Mazar does when she's digging at the excavation. 
if we would just use the Bible as our guidebook for education, for life. Just think of the, the treasure trove of understanding and wisdom that we would uncover. Digging into God's truth will reshape the way you think about everything. It'll reshape the way you, you conduct yourself, the way you lead your life. Now, if you don't have a, a copy already, I mentioned it earlier, but be sure to request the United States and Britain in Prophecy. It's an incredibly helpful textbook because with respect to that everlasting covenant that God made with King David, the United States and Britain in Prophecy will, will show you exactly where you need to dig in the Bible. It really isn't that difficult to prove. Not, as I said, not if you're prepared to do a little digging. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you again next time on The Trumpet Daily.